morning. Let's all stand. We're so glad to see you all here this morning. Praise God. Isn't it wonderful to get in your car and realize you don't have to scrape the ice off of it and there's no ice on the roads and it's just so warm everywhere? Thank you, Cindy. Psalm 145 says, I will exalt you, my God and my King. I will bless your name forever and ever, every day. I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Amen. You ready to do that this morning? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so glad we can be here in your presence to worship you and praise you, give you thanks you deserve. We ask you to meet with us here today and have your way in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. We want to shout hallelujah thank you jesus lord you're worthy of all the glory all the honor and all the praise it makes me want to shout it makes me want to shout hallelujah thank you jesus lord you're worthy of all the glory all the honor all the praise. Put your hands together. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how he picked me up and turned me we set my feet on solid ground. It makes me want to shout, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. It makes me want to shout, makes me want to shout, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, Lord, you're worthy of all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me. Lift your voices. When I think about the Lord, how he picked me up and turned me around, how he set my feet on solid ground, it makes me want to shout, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, Lord, you're worthy of all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. It makes me want to shout, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, Lord, you're worthy of all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. It makes me want to shout, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, Lord, you're worthy of all the glory, and all the honor, and all, all the praise. The greatest day in history. 
mystery death is beating you have rescued me sing it out jesus is alive the empty cross the empty grave love eternal you have won the day shout it out jesus is alive that Jesus came into my heart, took my sins away. When I was um, doing youth ministry a long time ago, clip art was just coming into its own, So, you, but you literally had to cut and paste it, not the way we do now. So we literally would cut. And I'll never forget, I saw a picture of a cross with a little person standing underneath it and hearts just like, you know, just exploding. And I'll never forget that because when I was five, I asked Jesus into my heart at a, um, 
at a Teen Challenge concert in Breckenridge, Minnesota. And I'll never forget, my doll was named Cookie forever after because Cookie came down and said to me, do you want to ask Jesus into your heart? And I said, yes. And that was the happiest day. And I was looking over here and I was watching people worship and they were just praising God because of that happy day. So maybe this is your day. Maybe this is the day you're gonna ask Jesus into your heart. Best day ever. So, wow, and I get to talk to kids and help them make those best decisions ever. Wow, praise God. So later in the service, we're going to be dismissing kids. And if right now you haven't checked your kids in yet, you can do it on the website. Just go to uh, Duluth Gospel Tabernacle. Go down to the bottom. It's right there. Or you can visit our kiosk out there. And um, just want you to know that we love having children at our church. I'm the children's pastor. My name is Rebecca. So before you are seated, you get to turn around and tell people that it's a happy day because you're here. So go ahead and do that. If you're watching online, if you want to say good morning, church, if you want to make some kind of comments, even during the message, amen or yes or something, we'd love to be able to kind of contact with you that way. You may be seated. If you're over by Joseph Huchthausen and Andrea, if you're over by Joseph, Joseph, a lot of you maybe don't know where you are, so maybe stand up. And then you've got some very happy news to announce with Andrea. Congratulations. All right. We are glad you're here. If so, if you want to connect with us, if you haven't connected with us yet, um, through email, you can give us this. You can put it in the offering um, boxes in the back. We'd love to be able to do that and love to connect with you through prayer, praise reports, testimony. If you want to sign up for something, you're going to hear through the announcements, all these different things happening, and we'd love to have you sign up. There's a summer serve insert that actually you can sign up for one Wednesday, one Sunday, trying to help Pastor Beck with all the different things going on, VBS, all these different things. So we'd love to have you involved in it, and you don't have to be specially gifted. I always tell people, you know, Jesus probably didn't have the feet-washing gift. When he washed the disciples' feet, he just saw there was something that needed to get done, so he did it. And so there could be that you're here today, and you realize, hey, there's some things that need to get done and maybe you can say, well, I just don't have that kid gift. Well, you can still help out in a big way. So we'd love to have you sign up. Again, you can take this, stick it in the offering boxes in the back, or hand it to Pastor Rebecca later on. I'm going to ask our youth pastor, Jesse, to come on up. Tell us about Action Corps. <laughs> hey. So uh, it's about that time here in May where Action Corps stuff starts heating up. And I just have to say, I'd love if we could just clap because this is the first time in three years we didn't have to change our plans for Action Corps. So I just have to, I seriously just have to praise God for that. <laughs> um, but we're going to Wombly, South Dakota, which is right outside of the Badlands. We're super excited for it. And like I said, things are heating up. So today after church, we have a uh, meeting for that. It'll be a really quick meeting. And then... Um, this Thursday, if, you, if your family sold stuff for the Shelton Foods fundraiser, um, their truck's going to pull up around 5 o'clock on Thursday, so you can pick up your orders, and maybe you can deliver them that night, um, or if you have fridge space, you can just keep it till whenever you want to give it to them. And then this Saturday, we have a work day, and we're st we are still looking for work jobs, so if you have uh, a job you'd like to hire us out to come do, we'd love to come serve you. And if you're a youth student, there's still room to sign up for the fundraiser, so... I encourage you to do that, but just continue praying for our trip and continue praying that um, things fall into line and that uh, it, it's an impactful time. Amen. Thank you, yeah. Jesse. Good job. Good job. Um, tonight, there's a worship night at Salem Covenant. There's like seven churches gathering together. I have a part of it. Part of our worship team does too. Six o'clock tonight at Salem Covenant over there in West Duluth. 
Tomorrow is a Vacation Bible School work day. We'd love to get you involved with that. That's from 10 to 12. This Wednesday night, we have our normal Wednesday night ministries going on. But then now when we get to June, the first Wednesday of June, we have our awards night. And then the next Wednesday in June, we have our grad night, dessert night. So sign up for those if you want. We'd love to have you be part of that. Then the third Sunday in June, we start back to children's ministry and some adult classes. So we'd love to have you come for that. Next Sunday, no Sunday school. All the Sunday school classes are meeting in the Fellowship Hall for Sunday, Promotion Sunday. And so um, we'd love to have you be there for that. And then the following night, that night, Sunday night, we have next Sunday night, 6 o'clock, we have a concert here. And the Action Corps will be having a bake sale. So there's a lot of things going on. Keep track of these things. Right now, as we're making some changes because of the graduation stuff and promotions, we're um, changing things around. But then we'll finally, in the Wednesday nights and Sunday, we start getting back to some sort of consistency. But we'd love to have you be part of those. We also want to say something about the finances. Uh, since we're a church family, it's important for you to know that finances have been very tight. So this is considered kind of a family meeting. If you're a visitor and uh, you're a guest of somebody today, we're not putting pressure on you. But if this is your home church, we would just like really encourage you to give on a regular basis. You can use the boxes here. You can give online. You can set up the, your giving, right? I had somebody come up to me before church and said, hey, can I meet with you to help me set up giving online? It's like, yes, amen. I'd be glad to help them do that. But we'd love to have you give on a regular basis. And summertime, we know that vacation homes, cabins, all these different things take place on the weekends. And But we'd still love to be able to count on finances as we go forward through this general offering we support ministries one of them is going to be coming up in a little bit to talk about their ministry going on here in Duluth and um, but we support ministries and missionaries all over the world through your finances and so we encourage you and we ask you to continue to give in a consistent basis the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver so as you put the offering in the box smile smile all right I'm gonna ask Veronica to come up tell us about one of the ministries we support is the Duluth Harbor Mission. Come on up. And she's got a table of stuff out there. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, thank you, Pastor Ralph, and everyone involved um, with Duluth Gospel Tabernacle Church. Um, your support has been phenomenal, and I'm going to share a little more about that. Um, I did hear that Pastor Ralph's retirement wasn't accepted, so I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> so um, now you know. <laughs> um, I have to refer to notes. Uh, I, I'm not a professional speaker, uh, so it, um, I'm, I get nervous. So I do have to refer to my notes. Um, I'm going to start off by saying thank you again. Um, this is the first time that I have spoken to your congregation. Um, I'm Veronica Jean Curlio, founder and director of Duluth Harbor Rescue Mission here in Lincoln Park. I am a Christian soldier. I am a mom, a grandma, and a wife to my husband, Tom Curlio, here um, sitting with us. Um, I am passionate about helping people who have lost hope in life um, and helping them to restore their hope through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, I grew up in West Duluth across the street from Marie and Paul Swanson. Some of you might remember them. I used to help Mr. Paul with his petunia pad when I was a little girl. If he left town, I was the one that was watering those petunias, just so you know. <laughs> um, I have done jail ministry work with Cheryl Steffens. I believe Cheryl, is she here today? No? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> And um, so, yeah, that's just a little bit about me. Uh, originally, I had a plan to share a video, but I f realized it was too long. I'm sorry about that, but you can find that video on YouTube under Homeless Heart Duluth Harbor Mission. It does feature Sidewalk Prophets. It is a very moving video about the vision of Duluth Harbor Mission. Uh, many of you do not know our beginning, so I'd like to share a little bit about that because it is remarkable. I returned to Duluth after living out of town for many years, and I returned to a city that was quite different than the one I grew up in. I quickly asked God to burden my heart for the lost in Duluth, 
And in short order, I was led to start a uh, street team ministry, uh, which included my husband Tom and numerous other friends of ours. We pulled red rider wagons. If you ever come to Duluth Harbor Mission, you will see those wagons there. We've, we've pulled wagons filled with basic needs for people that were living out on the street. Um, we would also set up a prayer station down on 20, um, right in front of the Salvation Army thrift store. We often had a, a prayer sh station set up on that corner. Um, we became, I became involved with the Union Gospel Mission downtown Duluth in 2014, serving on their board of, direct, board of, on their board of directors. And I also attended the New York School of Urban Ministry in New York City, where I was taught um, how to work with homeless people. Um, and I came back from that trip grieved, with a deep, deep desire to do something more in Duluth that involved people living outside. I made a list of my needs, the things that I thought I would need while I was on the plane. I, I made this list. I cried. It was an emotional time. God Almighty, is this me? Is this you? Where is this coming from? It's so passionate. And I remember making that list and saying, Father, if this is you, then I need money. And that's that. The following week in church, a woman approached me and gave me a check for $5,000. And she said, I don't want you to stop doing street ministry. The following week, she came to church again with another check for $6,000 and said, please do not stop doing street ministry work. You can be sure that money was allocated rightly. Uh, we used $300 a month for four years uh, to continue doing street ministry work. That money I will share. Um, she has given me permission. I often share because it was such a huge gift, and their heart for the Lord is tremendous, came from the Grusendorf family. She, um, excuse me, so while I was on the board at the Union Gospel Mission, I did see that something different was needed in our city that needed to glorify Christ and show the homeless soul that the power of God um, is available to them to help them through their troubles, that our God is bigger than their messes out there. I made a few phone calls. I called up some smart friends. I asked them, would you like to join me in something new and big out on the west side of town where we, there's truly not many resources for homeless people. We organized our board in February of 2016, and we served our first hot meal in September of that same year. In March of 17, a woman who was watching us, be careful because someone's always watching, a woman who was watching us took me out to dinner laid out pictures of buildings for sale on the table and asked which one I liked she was going to buy it for me to have Duluth Harbor Mission. She owned the building, but she only charged us $100 rent, and she paid all the utilities. There are more amazing testimonies on what the Lord has done for this place to be where it is. Okay, you need to know this. Um, God is really working here. So here we are six years later. <clears throat> I'd like to explain the word rescue in our name, Duluth Harbor Rescue Mission. A rescue mission focuses on long-term care. We see the homeless shelter as a recruiting ground for people needing and seeking life change. We are a community-supported extension of our, ch of our churches here in Duluth. In 2021, we served 4,066 hot meals, not including our Christmas, Easter, and Thanksgiving dinners where we served hundreds. Um, We've also obviously given out a thousand or so more grocery bags over the year, unmeasurable amounts of blankets, sleeping bags, two-man tents, winter gear, shoes, socks, underwear, hygiene, the list goes on. Your own church, Duluth Gospel Tab, has collected donations for us. Your team, Joy, has blessed us with diapers and hygiene collections. Um, Carol has blessed us with birthday kits and the mats that she weaves for the homeless. Um, Kathy and the gals have gone down to the Goodwill 99 cent day and, and purchased coats for us. Um, Duluth Harbor Mission, or excuse me, um, Duluth Gospel Tabernacle um, has committed to a recurring donation um, begin, beginning last year. Um, and that recurring donation, that recurring gift continues today. In 2021, Duluth Gospel Tab contributed $1,972.56 to Duluth Harbor Mission in which 1,422.56 cents was raised by your kiddos during Vacation Bible School. <laughs> 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 
Last year, some of you also maybe remember, during Vacation Bible School, there was a homeless person lurking around during that time, and that was me. And for some of you that don't know, it was quite a, a, an amazing experience for everybody, but I think the adults here at the church were affected a little more than the kids were in, in some ways. Who is that? And we might need help around here. <laughs> but um, it was really good. I dressed up as a homeless person, and I spoke with the kids, and as I was speaking, underneath I had business clothes on and, and, and my hair was ratted and my face was dirty, but as I'm speaking to the kids, I'm disrobing, I'm pulling out my hair, I'm washing my face, they see the business person and they see that underneath that homeless person that they see out there is a real person. Uh, you know, a person who has, has trouble and right now they're having a hard time. And kind of that's the message that was um, given during that time. Duluth Harbor Mission operates under the guidance of City Gate Network, who exists to educate, train, and offer resources to rescue missions throughout the United States. They update us often with news from Washington, where they're often a part of congressional meetings on homelessness. Um, City Gate Network is a gospel-centered organization. Our membership with them gives us access to best practice policies and governance policies and training. Actually, I leave next week for San Antonio uh, for their annual conference. It's a week-long gathering of over a thousand directors, board members, and others who are deeply involved with rescue missions. Um, through CityGate, we have gained respect and built relationships with directors all over the United States, including Andy Bowles, who's a friend of mine from Union Rescue Mission in LA, Skid Row. <coughs> Excuse me. The knowledge that I have gleaned from CityGate is priceless. Um, our whole board, everyone, um, we have just gained so much from being involved with CityGate Network, and it enhances our impact and allows us to feel safe. Um, since through CityGate, we are also members of Alliance Defending Freedom and have access to professional, gospel-oriented legal advice and direction, which is very needed today when you're running a church-type organization. Our impact. A year ago, I prayed and asked, asked God to show me something big that Duluth Harbor Mission, because of Duluth Harbor Mission, something big, God, I want to see something big. That day, that day, folks, a mom came in to Duluth Harbor Mission, and she came in and she said to me, I want to tell you that you helped my son. You fed him, you clothed him, you encouraged him, and you prayed with him. You showed him Jesus. I want you to know that my son went to treatment and is two years sober today and a fully functioning follower of Christ. And I want to thank you so much. I want to thank you guys. How do, how do we make an impact, make a difference? How do we do that? We are unique in Duluth because we focus on relationships with the homeless people. We focus on relationships with people where others claim are untouchable. We focus on relationships and helping them feel valued. Our first relationship that we focus on, though, is with Jesus Christ. Jesus is our way, he is our truth, and he is our life at DHM. We operate through the power of his Holy Spirit, and his word is our guide. We share Jesus with every soul that comes in every single day. We do not point out to folks that they are sinners heading for hell. The devil will use that information right off the bat to deter them from coming back in. So we build a relationship and we show them their value and we show them their value through Christ's eyes. They already know they're deep in sin. Their shame and their guilt keeps them from receiving God's grace and God's mercy and God's forgiveness. We have an opportunity daily as an extension of the church to share with them about their value and who they can be in Christ. And that conversation does come about repentance. It does happen, but it doesn't happen on day one. I just want to be transparent with you. We have a poster in the mission that reads in part, Noah got drunk, Rahab was a prostitute, and David was a murderer, and that list goes on. But the bottom line of this poster is they were forgiven, and they were used by God. But posters and meals and socks, those are just our tackle box. We are fishers of men. It's through our own personal testimonies we often share and the testimonies of Teen Challenge, who often helps, that pierce the hearts of the lost souls filled with all of this demonic activity. It's a sermon on the TV and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our place 
that impacts these lives. Two men recently were visiting. My husband, Tom, overheard them. These men are, are living on the street, and they're sitting together, and they're being very transparent with each other. One said, man, when I come into this place, something happens. Something different happens in me. And the other man said, yeah, me too. Sometimes I feel like I'm going to cry. Everything is, is built up in me, and it's like I, it wants to come out, and we give glory to God for that. We are unique in that we encourage treatment and work with each individual to make a plan and find an appropriate treatment facility for them. We remain in contact with them while they're in treatment, and we even pick them up for church services if they're ready and they want and they're willing. And when they're done with treatment, we work with them to, to plan short-term goals, long-term goals, and continue their encouragement during the most difficult time of their lives. There was a UCLA study that showed 75% of homeless souls are addicted to drugs. Today's homelessness is not the same as it was in the 70s and the 80s. Meth has hit the scene. It came about the 90s, the early 90s. And from there on, we have seen a darkness in our nation that we could never imagine. So when we want to help a homeless person, I'm going to tell you, housing first is not the answer. I recommend a great book called Behind the Red Door to learn more about the sad impact that Housing First has made on our nation and the homeless souls. Another, week, another way we are unique is that I hear that we have the best meal in town and the people feel safe and have peace when they come into our facility, especially the women. I'm going to touch a bit regarding the government and homelessness, and my hands are on my hips. When we house a homeless, addicted person, we are inviting their death. And I know that sounds pretty dramatic, but it's the truth. We hear all the great numbers about those who are housed. We hear about the billions of dollars that are being spent on housing. And we see people patting themselves on the back, yet we don't hear that many of those that are housed either die within the first six months of overdose or they leave the house. A meth addict is not capable of living in an apartment by themselves. It's just true. The whole thing? A meth addict is not capable of living in an apartment on their own. That is not true. To house a homeless person off the street because of that UCLA study, and we know that 75% of the homeless are addicted, because of that, no, housing is not the answer for our homeless souls today. Therefore, our stance is pushing treatment before housing. We are passionate to get to the root of the homelessness. I've been to m many workshops on this topic, and I am blown away by the billions of dollars our country has spent on housing with 33 housing programs our federal aid gov government has and billions of dollars poured into homelessness, close to $6 billion in 2021, the homeless issue has only become worse, obviously because something isn't working. The people that are planning on how to spend our money are not aware of the demonic activity taking place. Um, there's just so much I could say about it, but that's where I'm at with all of that. Um, housing first is not effective. Having access to immediate intervention is key when someone is ready for life change, and that involves a team of people and God Almighty, the church. With that being said, it's my biggest passion to restart our Millie's House faith-based, Christ-centered home for women, except we want a staff, not just one person living there like we did in the past. We need a staff. We need to purchase a home, not rent a home as we did in the past. As we speak, I have one girl in a hotel through our Frank and Sue Staria Help Fund. This woman has completed treatment only to return to her sister's home where drug activity is prominent, and she packed her bags and left and went back to the streets. Now tell me, trust me, that takes courage to choose to go to the streets, but that's how bad she does not want to use again. So she comes to us, and we're able to help her keep her in a safe place, only because she does have housing lined up for next week. She is sober. She is not actively using. And I can help her. We can help her stay safe until her housing opens up next week. We often hear, and this is the truth, 
about rapes and beatings and theft. Just last week, a girl showed me her arm where men took advantage of her while she was in, while they, after they in, gave her drugs. The evil that exists on our streets of Duluth is unprecedented and rarely reported. The church must take action for someone like Heather, not her name, to choose the option to go back to the street, as I said, takes so much courage. We have helped and, and, and hoteled pregnant homeless women to remain safe until they can get help from family members to come and get them, situations like that. To reopen Millie's House means Duluth Harbor Mission needs organized fundraising. I need a committee that can meet once a month to plan great fundraisers for this project. This project would involve payroll and all the dollars involved in keeping a home filled with women, keeping the home up. Keep in mind, we do not have a congregation to support us, and we don't receive government funding as to ensure God remains our authority. Millie's House is unique in that we are a 100% faith-based, Christ-centered facility. And we are also seeking one or three more board members. Currently we have six, and I'd like to keep the total at an odd number for voting purposes. And we do need a few more good volunteers. Currently we have 12, which includes two or three men from Teen Challenge every Friday. Our current roster of volunteers has been with us for years. They do fulfill, and you would be fulfilling, your own personal ministry desire by serving the Lord through DHM. Our doors would be closed if not for the volunteers. I also like to share with you um, recently the number of senior citizens who can't afford food and medicine has risen. I have our recent newsletter on the back table that talks more about this, but it's extremely heartbreaking to see someone humbly, an elderly person humbly coming in and asking for food so she can get her medicine. Keeping our food pantry stocked has been challenging. We cannot receive deliveries from Second Harvest because we're not large enough to store the required amount for delivery. Our non-perishables, etc., are stocked when someone donates canned or box goods or I go shopping for them. And we all know what's happening at the grocery store. I have information on our back table. Are we doing all we can? As a body of Christ for his poor and his oppressed and his addicted, his abused, they won't come here, but they're coming there. And we guide them to here when they're ready, of course. Of course. That lady that came in my office could have been better served if Millie's house was there and we could have whisked her off to a safe place and started working with her to help her feel whole again. We leave our desires in God's hands, and with his provision, we will move ahead. Otherwise, we just pray for contentment with what he's already provided for us. No matter what, we believe together. I'm sorry. <laughs> we believe that together we will continue to make an impact for Christ's sake. I leave you with this. Everything we do about everything we do is about transformation through Christ with a focus on individuals struggling with addiction and poverty yet addressing the root cause we accomplish this by providing free Christian recovery services resources along with meeting immediate needs of their homelessness when you give you are giving through DHM not to DHM please know that your dollars are spent wisely with the eyes of Christ upon us Thank you for this time and your support. Now with that, Pastor said, mention prayer needs. So our greatest prayer need truly is for wisdom and direction on growing and how we grow and the direction on that. Praying for more volunteers so we can expand our hours. And when I asked my husband, what should we pray for? He said, pray for the hearts of the people who come in and that God will transform their lives. On the table are street cards, they're like little business cards. You can take a couple. These are for you to have in your car if you see a homeless person with the sign up that says, I need pizza. 
<laughs> give me five dollars whatever hand them a street card it has our address on it and and information about us that they can use to find us um, there's a free pen on the back table and also another prayer need is should we purchase the old Newman's pharmacy that is directly next door to us um, it's typical for rescue missions to have thrift stores and um, we're thinking with Salvation Army closing that perhaps that might be an answer for our town and for those in need. So God bless you. Thank you for this time. And um, I forgive me for the going over. That's, yeah. <laughs> Praise God. We appreciate your ministry so much. Thank you. And so we have collected things in the past. Are there things right now that we could drop off or collect for you? I know in the winter it's blankets and that sort of thing. Um, do you still need blankets? Do you still need stuff like that? Or what, what are some things? We always need blankets. We always need blankets. We always need your old, uh, gently used whatever tennis shoes. Um, a good shoe is so important. The homeless people put so many miles on their feet. Honestly, we have people come in with slippers, you know, or one shoe. Uh, so blankets, shoes, and always the non-perishable goods, especially with the pop top lids, because the homeless person can pop that top and just eat right out of the can. All right. And then sometimes it's toiletries, toothpaste, that sort of thing, toothbrushes. Absolutely, or? yes. Um, hygiene items, um, deodorants, shampoo, um, body wash. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's all stand. Let's pray for this mission. Let's pray for Veronica and her husband, Tom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for people like Veronica and her husband Tom who have a burden and a heart and have, are willing to take action and steps of faith. We pray a blessing of them. Give them wisdom, discernment, what to do about the pharmacy next door that is closed. And for Millie's house, Lord, we just pray that you would continue to bring in the finances and lead the board, lead this ministry as they take these steps of faith. And Lord, for those that are here today that maybe should be volunteering at a place like this, speak to their hearts. Speak to our hearts, Lord, what we can do to help to volunteer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. What are the age, ages like? How young can somebody come to volunteer? Because you've got a lot of youth that maybe they're always looking for something good to do. Well, um, I, I would have to say I'd like to see 18 or so. Um, okay. There's a lot of stuff there that only adults can experience okay. if a parent comes in with a younger mm -hmm. 14 16 is there stuff for them to do if a parent brings sure. in a younger yes. person okay. yes yes all right um, also on the back table I have a, a paper where you can put your email address if you want to receive our newsletter or your home address where we can mail the newsletter to also all right praise okay. God thank you Veronica thank, thank you. you Tom um, and ask Mike Solomon to come on up to lead us in prayer should we dismiss kids right now? Okay, we're going to dismiss kids to Children's Church up to 6th grade. Follow Pastor Rebecca out. Good morning, everybody. I'm Mike Solomon. And um, you're all standing, so like to go to the Lord in prayer today and so much to be in prayerful about um, Nate Dobler needs our prayers Jan Zaitso needs our prayers we need to continue to pray for our pastoral search as we look for a new pastor um, the church finances all that's going on in the world over in Europe with Russia and Ukraine um, we need to pray for peace there um, so there's quite a bit that we need to be in prayer about. And there's also a lot to be thankful for, for a, a, a new marriage that's coming. Um, we have a grandson that today is being dedicated, our first grandson, so we're just excited about that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just lift up our needs of our church and the people here in the church that the needs that are spoken and also unspoken, Lord, we pray for wisdom. We pray for courage, Lord, to stand up for you in the face of all that's going on in our country and around the world. Lord, we just lift up Nate Dobler today, Lord, and we pray that you would comfort Nate and give him peace, Lord. 
Um, we pray for Jan, Lord, and all that's going on in her life, Lord, that you would give her comfort and peace, Lord. We pray for our Supreme Court, Lord, and what's going on with the abortion issue, Lord. We pray for wisdom. Lord, we pray that this abortion issue would be put to rest, that it would be outlawed, Lord, and that the protection of the unborn, Lord, would be the most important thing, Lord. Lord, we just pray for peace between Russia and Ukraine and all that's going on there and the, the havoc it's creating in our world, Lord, and even in our country here with all that's going on with inflation and gas prices and, and everything, Lord, that we're having to deal with. And Lord, we just thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your salvation, Lord, and your mercy, all that you do for us, Lord. We thank you for grandchildren who are being dedicated today, little Judd, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that he would walk with you and you would walk with him all the days of his life, Lord. We just praise you and thank you for your goodness. We pray for our pastoral search, Lord, as we look for a new pastor. Lord, that you would bring the right man, Lord, to this church that we need, Lord, to help us, Lord, as we transition. Uh, Lord, we pray for our finances here at the church, Lord. We pray for wisdom. We pray for your blessing to be upon us, Lord. We just thank you and praise you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray, and we all say amen. We're going to continue in worship here. We've got one more song to sing before Pastor comes up to speak. The song, the chorus is Show Us Your Glory. And something that we've just like said and prayed and sung so many times. And as she was sharing, I felt like that's an example of showing us your glory. Hearing the testimonies and hearing about the work that is being done just in that specific ministry, that's, that's his glory. And we'll be singing about chains falling, fear bowing, lives being healed, hopes being found. That's all of our prayer.
Jesus, you change everything. Christ, heal all found here now. Jesus, you change everything. Chains fall, fear bow here now. Jesus, you change everything. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, we do ask for that, that your Holy Spirit would change lives. There'd be transformations taking place. That even now, people giving their hearts to you in a new way, asking you to move in a new way in their life, to lead them and guide them. That chains would be falling, Lord. Addictions would be breaking by the power of your Holy Spirit. As we look into your word today, we ask that you would lead us and guide us. Teach us, Lord. Speak to us in all the different situations, the circumstances, the different ages that are here. Speak to us. Lead us and guide us. Have your way in our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Everybody says, amen. amen, amen. You may be seated. There's a bulletin insert that has kind of some notes you're able to take. I encourage you to do that. Today we're talking about the millennium. And uh, it's not the millennium that maybe some of you are used to. We're talking about the millennium falcon. Does anybody know what the millennium falcon is? It's a few. Um, we're not talking about that today. There is a picture of it. If you want to go to the next picture, there we go. There. There we go. Huh? We're talking about the thousand-year reign of Christ. Now, the thousand-year reign of Christ, we are going to experience amazing peace. Peace like we've never felt before. But before I talk about that, I want us to understand that there's peace for us to have today. That God wants us to have peace with himself through Jesus Christ. God wants us to have peace within, again, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And God wants us to have a peace with others, right? And that's right now. That's right now. God wants to give you peace that through a relationship through Jesus Christ. So if you're here today and you don't know God and you're feel far away, God provided Jesus Christ to bring you near, that you would have peace with God. Romans 5.1 says, peace, that we have peace with God since we've been justified through faith, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Ephesians 2 verse 13 says, but now in Christ Jesus... You who are once far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. Through Christ, we have peace with God. That's the only way you can have peace with God. It's not by works. You can never do enough good works. It's not because you're baptized, not because you've endured listening to my sermons for all these 25 years. You can't do enough good works. And then through Christ, the Bible says we have peace within. John 14, verse 27, Jesus says, The peace I give you, is not as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled. Do not be afraid. That's right on the cover of the bulletin today. That he wants to give us peace within. He says, I don't give you peace like the world gives. Now, what kind of peace does the world give? Well, it's, you have peace if everything's going great. Circumstances are going smooth. No bad reports from the doctor. No conflicts in life. No, everything's just going great. But the Bible says that through Christ, we have peace that actually it describes it as peace beyond understanding. We don't understand how we can have peace in these circumstances because it's supernatural peace that God gives. Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your sweet spirit be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God and what? And the peace of God, 
which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind. So there's a process. The process of rejoicing in the Lord in all circumstances. Again, I say rejoice. To bring your thoughts, your cares to the Lord. The Bible says, cast all your cares upon the Lord. He cares for you. But then it says, with supplication and thanksgiving, to let your request be known. And then the peace of God will guard our hearts. Hallelujah. 2 Thessalonians 3 says, May the Lord of peace continually grant you peace in every circumstance. See, that's supernatural peace. That no matter what we're going through, no matter what our thoughts, this is where taking every thought captive is so obedient. Because when you watch the news or you think about and you look at circumstances, it's easy then for you to start getting all stressed out. And you get very anxious. You start listening to what other people are saying. Listen to what the Bible says, that you can cast your cares upon the Lord, for he cares for you. That in the midst of tough times, go to the Lord. It might be in school. It might be at work. It might be in your family. The circumstances look bad. And I just remind yourself of, of how Peter walked on the water. He's walking on the water in a miraculous way, but as he's walking on the water in this miraculous way, he says, he begins to look at the wind and the waves, and he's trying to think, what in the world am I doing? Then he starts to sink. So we can have peace within. Hallelujah. But then he also says we should have peace with others. First Peter 3 says we should seek peace. Make things right with your brothers and sisters. Don't just carry it on. Make things right. Forgive. James 3.18 says the peacemakers will reap righteousness. Be a peacemaker. If at all possible, Romans 12 says, be at peace with all men. That doesn't mean you hide what you believe about Jesus Christ, but that means you're not out there causing trouble. There are some things that are very important to be strong on. And that, of course, is our faith in Jesus Christ. There are some other things that Christians have really become divided about. They've allowed the situations in our culture to divide us. And it's different in every country. When I've been in Liberia, it's other things. The vaccinations, all these different things, that doesn't, that doesn't even affect them. But there are other things going on in their churches that when I'm there teaching at the Bible school, the pastors begin to ask questions and we begin to talk about circumstances over there that are different than our circumstances, but those are the things that, the, that Satan uses to divide the church. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11 says, Encourage each other. Live in peace, and the God of all peace shall be with you. And of course, Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers for they should be called children of God. Now, that's for now. You can have peace within. You can have peace with God. You should have peace with others. But we're coming to a time, the millennium, where there's going to be amazing peace, amazing joy in the presence of God. So here again is that chart. And I keep putting this chart up, and I know it's hard to read, but just so you kind of get a general idea, that if you look there, the rapture of the church, so right now we're in the church age, then we come to the rapture of the church and that's the beginning of the tribulation. Many believe halfway through the tribulation there'll be peace in the beginning. Halfway through there'll be the, um, the great desecration that's going to come to the temple. All hell will break loose. And then we have this tribulation, the rest of the tribulation. And then the second coming of Christ. The battle of Armageddon, the second coming. And then that begins the thousand-year reign of Christ. Now six times in Revelation 20 it talks about thousand years. Millennium just means... A thousand years. So six times it says there shall be these thousand years. Now there's some that say, well, there's no actual millennium. So I'll get these three views of the millennium. Before we talk about what we do agree with, first there are some that say, no, there's not actually going to be a millennium. It's just all, all just you know, flabber, just you know, doesn't mean anything. Symbolism, you know, fables. Not many Christians believe that because if they believe the Bible, they'll believe something about that. The second view is that they believe, there are some Christians that believe, we're in the millennium now. Which really seems weird to me. But they believe that this is the opportunity for the church to become the church, the body of Christ. is going to become better and better and stronger and stronger. And pretty soon, we're going to have Christians in politics. We're going to have Christians in ruling. We're going to have all the Christian businessmen. We're all going to be Christians everywhere. And that's going to usher in that return of Christ. Now, I don't believe that that's 
happening. I, I, it seems like the world is getting worse and worse. We're doing the best we can. The body of Christ is doing the best they can. So that's talked about post-millennial because they believe eventually when the body of Christ does the best they can and gets stronger and better and brighter and brighter, Jesus is going to come back. The third view is called premillennial, which means that we are the ones that believe Christ is going to return, as we read in chapter 19, Christ is going to return, and that's going to start the millennium. Now, most evangelical conservative scholars believe that, that it is, we believe in the premillennial return of Christ. And when Christ returns after the Battle of Armageddon, then, then we're going to have this thousand-year reign of Christ. So I'm going to talk about five things that most Christians, and I, you know, when you're going to preach, you do a lot of study. And so and some of you have been studying this for a long time. You love talking about end-time events. And if you do, and that's something that you just love to study and talk about, and you want to discuss everything you've read, I would say start a Bible study. Do a home group. Do a Wednesday night. You have an hour and a half. And now, in the, actually, the summer, we go to two hours. If you want to start a Bible study or a home group or a Wednesday night study, and all you're going to talk about is end times, things you're reading and studying, all the different opinions, and believe me, there are many. We won't be discussing all of those things today, so if you want to start a group, have at it. Have at it. Have fun. But Revelation 20, if you have Revelation 20 open yet, let's read the first four verses. So this is now, again, after chapter 19. This is after the Battle of Armageddon. The return of Christ, it says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and the great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and he threw him into the abyss and shut it, sealed it, so that he could not deceive the nations any longer until a thousand years were completed, and after these things he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and I, judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus, because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark of the, of the four, on the forehead and the hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Okay, let's talk about just that. The, first of all, most Christians, almost all Christians believe what it says here. There's coming the time in the millennium where Satan is going to be bound. Satan is going to be bound. Now, I love the picture, if you can picture that. An angel comes and grabs hold of the devil and throws him in the abyss and locks him up. Now, he's a spiritual being, but that's going to happen. Satan is going to be bound up. So if you want to go to the next slide, Kate. There we go. So the removal of Satan. Now, 1 Peter 5, 8 says Satan, Satan had come. He's an adversary of the church. He's trying to stop the church. Now, Jesus said, I'm building my church at the gates of hell. The powers of hell, the authorities of hell will not be able to stand against it. So we have authority. In Mark 16, it says, we as believers have been given authority, given from Christ to resist the devil. 1 Peter 5 says we should resist the devil. And so right now we have this, this opportunity to resist him, but he's still powerful. He's still in the world today. Veronica talked about the addictions that's going on. And there are people that, that get, break free from their addictions. But then the demonic powers are so strong, they pull them back in. And she's right. There are some, there are some places that they try to help them that are, that are drug addicted and they get free, but they're not dealing with the spiritual problem that we have today. And that's part of as a Christians. That's what we should be doing. Now, as you refer to the dragon, now in the Greek, that word dragon means a terrible monster. He's the serpent of old. He's the devil. But thank God, the millennium, he's going to be locked up. Won't that be great to experience that? Well, let's go on. The second thing most people agree with, most Christians would say, yes, Jesus is going to rule. He's going to reign in a way that we've never seen or experienced. Right now, no matter what party you're part of, politics is just very frustrating. Even though Christians, we elect Christians, we should elect Christians, we should have Christians in office, they're limited by all the other politicians. I'm thankful for Christians that have been involved with politics. I'm thankful for Christians in every aspect of life. 
We need, we need more Christians in schools. We need more Christians teaching. We need more Christians at McDonald's, Menards, anywhere. And we need more Christians in politics. But I'm looking forward to the day of the millennium where there will be no more politics, no more voting, no more vaccinations, no more need of any of that. We will have peace. In Luke 1, the angel came to the Virgin Mary and told her that what's going to happen, she'll have a son. He shall name his name Jesus. But then it goes on to say, and he will have a kingdom that will never end. It will go forever and ever. Well, that's talking about the millennium. So as Christians, we are looking forward to that time. The Bible says there's going to be a thousand years. So what's going to happen to us? Well, it goes on. Verses 4 to 6, it talks about the fact that we are here. It says we're going to be sat on thrones. And uh, it says, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And those that had not worshipped the beast or the image and not received the mark. The rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were completed. Okay, so the rest of the dead are the people that are not saved. The first resurrection, that's for Christians. We are going to be part of the first resurrection. So what does the Bible say? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 2 Corinthians 5, that we're going to have glorified bodies. I'm glad I'm not bringing this body for the next thousand years in the millennium. Aren't you glad for that? Glorified bodies. Hard to understand. That's sci-fi stuff. That Jesus had a physical body. He said, touch my hand. Do you have food to eat? I want to eat. But yet, he could appear and disappear. That's a glorified body. That's an amazing body. No more knee pain. No more getting ready to run a marathon that you can't run. Resurrected bodies, we're going to be rewarded. The Bible says over and over again about the rewards that we're going to receive that don't live for this life, don't live and get everything today because great is your reward in heaven. So we're going to be rewarded for the things we've done here. See, a lot of times, people are working behind the scenes. In this church, people are praying. They're giving financially. They're giving of themselves in many ways. They don't get all the rewards in this life, but they're going to get it in the next life. I like what Billy Graham says when he... Well, he used to say, I guess, he's in heaven now. But he used to talk about the Crusades and all the people that got saved in Korea or wherever he preached. And he said, you know, it's not going to be... I'm not going to get the credit for that. It's going to be all the people that work behind the scenes to get it done and all those people praying, fasting and praying for that to happen. At our last mission committee meeting, we had some people. We had Beth Baker come, who was raised in this church, and she talked about how she remembers she walks through these hallways and goes to these different rooms where she made that commitment to serve Christ. Now her and her husband are working with online studies to teach and train pastors all over the world. You know, you think about all these different people that have been impacted by the people that are in this church that have given sacrificially. They're praying, praying, giving, giving of themselves. You're going to get rewarded for that. The Bible says then we're going to reign with Christ. We are going to reign with Christ. These are the people that have given their lives. If you read there, it says they've been beheaded for the testimony. They didn't worship the beast or the image. They did not receive the mark. They took a stand. Resurrection body, rewarded, reign with Christ. We're going to be there. If you're a Christian, you're going to be there. Be there. Now, what happens after the millennium? Well, again, there's a lot of different views of this, but we read very plainly here, after millennium, it says that after a thousand years, Christ is going to re release Satan for a short time. He's releasing Satan, and he says Satan's going to go about and try to deceive the nations. So that is a, a name of Satan. He is a deceiver. I think what's amazing when we think about the prophecies, because it mentions here the, the city. It talks about this city. It says, when a thousand years are over, this is starting in verse 7, he will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. Let me just say that some of these prophecies, so many of these go back to the Old Testament, and especially the book of Daniel. And these are some things that I mean for you to study on your own or study with a group. Go back to some of these incredible prophecies and how they all fit together. It says they're going to gather together in battle. In number, they're going to be like the sand on the seashore. 
And they marched against the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loved. Now that's Jerusalem. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They're going to be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, the prophecies in the Old Testament, is pretty amazing. Zechariah promised that God speaks and he says, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. This is Zechariah 12, 2. I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all people around about when they shall in siege against, have a siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And in that day, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people, all the burden themselves, and they shall be cut in pieces. Zechariah 14, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be taken. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. Those are prophecies made when Jerusalem was wrecked up. It had been torn apart. Jerusalem was laid in waste. Do you remember the stories about Nehemiah, how Nehemiah felt bad for Jerusalem because they were trying to rebuild, but they needed to go back and rebuild the wall. Haggai, Ezra talk about going back to that place of Jerusalem and Israel and trying to rebuild because it was such a wreck. But yet Zechariah prophesies that someday all the nations of the world are going to come against Israel and Israel will have the victory. Jerusalem will have the victory. Now isn't that amazing? And we see that happen. You look at a map. You look at a world map. We have one downstairs here if you need to look at one. You look at that little tiny slice of country, Israel. And you look at the world and how so often the United Nations and these countries of the world are trying to gather and, and be against Israel. And God has always stood by Israel. The prophecies that God has given. And here he says there will be that day. But God is going to get the victory. Amen? God will get the victory. The last thing, the fifth thing that most Christians would agree on is this idea of the book of life. And this is probably one of the sad parts of this chapter is here when it talks about the book of life and the names that were not in the book of life. He looks, let's start with verse 11. I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, whose presence earth and heaven fled away. There was no place was found for them. I saw the dead, the great, the small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from all the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which was in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Verse 15. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Hell is a real place. Jesus warned us about hell. Jesus warned us that there are people that have not given their life to Christ. Their name is not written in the book of life. Now, is there going to be a physical book? I don't know, but it sure mentions it often, that there is going to be a book of life. And is your name written in the book of life? Has God written your name? In Luke 10, verse 20, Jesus said, Don't be glad because the evil spirits obey you. Rather, be glad because your names are written in in heaven. Daniel talked about the names written in heaven. Philippians 4, Paul mentions names, Christians that were with him, they said their names have been written in heaven. Now, is it a spiritual book? Is it a spiritual way? But it's, it's something to do with God knows you. God has a reservation for you. It's like Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you. So, does God have your name written down? It's a very sad thing when it reads here that those names that were not found written, they were thrown into the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. Jesus refers to hell as a place that is torment forever and ever. In 2 Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 5, 11 says, Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Matthew 25, Jesus mentions the judgment. He says, Depart from me into everlasting fire. So, Serious chapters, serious things that are going on through the book of Revelation. As we come to the end, next Sunday we're going to talk about heaven. That's a wonderful thing to talk about, isn't it? It's a lot more exciting to talk about heaven. But it's a serious thing when the Bible warns us about hell, and what are we going to do about it? Do we have the opportunity to do something about it?
to get people's names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Let's talk about, I just want to go through three applications very quickly. Number one, we have the opportunity today. We have the opportunity today. You have the opportunity today. I have an opportunity today to experience peace. God's wonderful peace. Every one of us. You have an opportunity to experience peace with God, peace within, and peace with people by the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? Number two, we have the wonderful privilege to help others experience wonderful peace. You have that opportunity. Romans 10, verse 11 says, And how shall they preach unless they're sent? As it's written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings. So, I don't know what your feet look like. I think this is kind of a spiritual example. How beautiful are the feet of them that bring the gospel of peace. Are you bringing it? Now it says, how can they preach unless they're sent? So let me just say this. We're sending you. <laughs> we're sending you, we're sending you, we're sending you. You are sent. Just as Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. We're sending you. Now you don't go on your own, but you go in the power of the Holy Spirit. You have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Tell somebody. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Don't be quiet. Don't hide it. Jesus said you don't strike a light and then hide it under a bushel basket. Right? Sing that song. Maybe wake up every morning and sing that song. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Right? You wake up in the morning, have that in your heart. Lord, today, today, Lord, let my light shine. I'm not going to hide it. Right? Thirdly, we have the amazing opportunity to be empowered by his spirit to be the people God wants. Veronica mentioned some ways that we can help. It'd be very sad if we all hear this and go, wow, that's just so great what she's doing. But we're not willing to let the Lord speak to us and, volunteer, and get us to volunteer. Philippians 1, 6 says, I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ returns. God has started a good work in you. Ephesians says we're God's masterpiece. We're, God is working in us. We're like the clay and he's the potter. What, are you allowing him? Are you the stiff clay, the cold clay that's not, you're not being willing to form, be formed into his hand to have him form you to do and to be who he wants you to be? The potter, if you've ever seen a potter, if you've ever done that, they take some water, they kind of get the, get the clay loosened up. You know, they take the clay out of the bucket the whole time, the clay is screaming, what are you doing to me? What are you doing to me? And you put the clay in, the, you're starting to form the clay, and the, the clay is going, hey, leave me alone. I want to stay what I am. The clay talks. Have you experienced that? And then they make this beautiful cup, and they go, oh, wow, I look so good. I'm so happy the way I am. And then they put the glaze on and stick the cup in the, the burner, the kiln. Ah, what are you doing to me? Leave me alone. Take it out, and it's just beautiful because the clay allowed the potter to decide what's next. What kind of clay are you? God has begun this good work in you. He will continue his work until that day when Jesus returns. Amen? We're gonna, our last song is a song, How Great Is Our God. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up. How Great Is Our God. It says, How Great Is Our God. Sing with me. How Great Is Our God. Age to age he stands, and in time, in his hands, in his hands, beginning in the end, that God had three in one. We are in his hands. Let's all stand and ask the elders, wives, youth leaders, others, if you want to come to pray with people, come and stand on the side. We'd love to pray with you as we believe together how great is our God, how great is our King. We sing, King Jesus, sur we surrender you, King Jesus. Amen? To every one of us, as we sing this song, King Jesus, I surrender to you. Thank you, Lord, for my salvation. And thank you, Lord, that you're still working in my life. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty.
majesty let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice how great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. His hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead, three in one. The Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great. Thank you, Lord, for your greatness. You're awesome in power. And you love us so deeply. Lord, we come with respect and honor. We worship you. And we thank you for the relationship that we can have with you where we can say, Abba, Father. And Lord, we do ask that for those that are here today that are hurting and things are going on in their life that they don't understand that they would draw near to you. And we thank you for the promise, Lord, that you said if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. So, Lord, as people even leave this place, we go in your presence. We ask that you would use us, use each one of us for our glory today and tomorrow and Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, all week long. Use us, Lord, for your glory. Empower us. Give us boldness. Give us discernment and wisdom. Help us to be fishers of men as we follow you. We give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen. 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 Lord bless you. Shake hands with a few people. Say hi to them. Introduce yourself.
Lord bless you.